woke up early this morning because, Leighton, I had a way to end this talk. God gave me a way to end it so that we could end with hope. But before we get there, there's some spanking that's going to happen this morning. <laughs> so, you know what's funny about hanging around Jafet de Oliveira? Is he's usually, you know, he's a pretty smart guy, right? And so when he asks you to do something, if you're not quick, you might miss the nuances to what he asks you to do. So when I got the outline of the things I was going to talk about, I was like, oh, really? I get to talk about these things? Okay. You know what? You asked for it. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know me, I'm sorry. <laughs> William Johnson, in this book, Authentic Adventism, begins after the preface by talking about the elephant in the room. And it was interesting listening to him talk about the elephant, Rich, because at the stage of his life that he's doing this reflection, he is an older man. And because the hermeneutic of charity is what ought to be reflected in the family and the kingdom of God, it takes a level of maturity to be able to say that I accept this elder statesman's reflection on his own complicity in the perpetuation of what he names as the elephant in the room. Now, a sister like me wanted him to be a little bit more passionate. I wanted him to be a little bit more, you know, I wanted more words. A sister like me wanted to know, well, well how come you didn't think about that 30 years ago, man of God? Because that's what happens when you are a recipient of the elephant that he names. And for anybody related to Bill Johnson, I'm not coming for him. <laughs> All right? I'm, I'm not mad at him. But he names it. And what they taught me in school, Dr. Clark Diller, was to be critical. So he names racism as the elephant in the room. And he talks about it within the context of the United States. And when we look in scripture, in the book of Genesis, we learn that God makes human humanity, forms us out of dirt, breathes into us, we become living beings. We see that we are invited to trust God for truth and understanding, and we choose to trust ourselves, do it myself, right? And then what God does is put in place a process and a plan to save us from ourselves. Because in this 2023, we see humanity continues to choose ways to hurt and harm one another. But those of us who subscribe to the fact that we, all human beings, are image bearers of God... Those of us who say we belong to the family of God, what's our excuse? Why are we still doing the things that our foreparents did? How come? Why? Like, why are we doing it? Let's jump in. Genesis 11 tells the story that after God resets creation, after Genesis 1 talks about him taking chaos and making it into beauty, that he undoes all of it with the flood. And then after those 40 days and nights, the waters recede. Noah comes out, and we get a reset, get a reboot. And by the time we get to Genesis 11, we are told that everyone spoke the same language. And what do we do? We make a decision. You know what? They created a technology called bricks. And they said, look at here, look at here, look at here. We're not going to get wiped out again. So let's build us something 
Let us build something to protect us. And God goes, what on earth are they doing? And what does God do? God comes down to see. I hope y'all get that. God always comes down to see. God comes to see and God goes, no, this is, no, this isn't going to work. I I know (laughs) y'all. No, 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 no. Let's let's do something different. And he confuses the language so that people now had to find others who sounded like them so they could communicate and they disperse according to language groups. When we go back through the Bible, we don't really see an explanation for what happens in Acts 2, right? We, we don't. It, there's no one set story that says, and then God made people that look like this and look like that. The Bible just says God made human and life, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. And through them, humanity came. There's some of you in this room, Japheth, who want to know in detail how all these things happen. I don't care. I'm a practical theologian. I just want to know, if this is what it says, how does it look in our lived experience? That's what my training is. But I will tell you this, that wherever human beings show up, we build empire. Turn to your neighbor and say empire. That's what we do. When we get together, we build empires. Whatever the technologies we have access to, we build empires. And the problem with empire building is it does not see people as people. It sees people as commodities to be used. They taught me this fancy word, telos. Teleological, this idea that they are not ends in themselves, but that they are means to an end. So when we look at what happens when empire building occurs, and let me, let me be a good theologian and read the scripture. It says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And then they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Empire building is about making a name for yourself. Empire building is about, you're going to know who I am. Isn't it crazy how social media's function in life is to do what? You're going to know who I am. I'm going to be a brand ambassador. You are going to follow me. That's another conversation for another day. Empire building When humans get our minds around it, we treat people as ends and not as people. Why does that matter? Because out of empire building came colonization. I stand before you this morning, I just did my Ancestry.com, because I grew up in the Caribbean. I lived on an island that was a former British colony. We got our independence much earlier than a lot of people did. And I grew up in a context that looks pretty much like this room, except there'd be more black people in the room. The thing is, we'd all be Jamaican. It didn't matter what your ethnicity was, you were Jamaican. And the only person who could talk about you as far as calling you either white or black or Asian would be another Jamaican. But if somebody came from another place and came to Jamaica and said something to Nathan about being a white Jamaican, all the Jamaicans would say, back up, Nathan's Jamaican. Because we were taught that we were out of many, one people. That only worked, though, when we did not take into account colorism, when we did not take into account classism, when we did not take into account sexism. So I remember growing up, asking my mother questions, because I was curious like that, very nosy kid, and I would ask my mom questions about her parents. And my mom told me that my grandfather's father was a blonde, blue-eyed black man. 
Make that make sense. How could he be blonde and blue-eyed and be black? Anybody know no room will know why? Because that's what we were told he was. Because even though phenotypically he looked like a white person, because he had a drop of black blood in him, he was not white. Did I get that right? You didn't. And that's the stuff we don't want to talk about. We don't want to talk about the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, with its global impact, have participated and been complicit in the erasure of people's cultures, people's identities, people's stories. We don't want to talk about the fact that racism is part and parcel of what it means to be a Christian Seventh-day Adventist. So we're going to be quiet and pray that Jesus comes, we're going to go to heaven, and it's going to get sorted out. I came by to tell you, you're not going to get to anybody's heaven. Not my Jesus is heaven. I don't know which heaven y'all going to. But the one I follow in the Bible, that mess is not going to happen again. So if we don't sort it out now, we're going to be here for a while. I know, I know, I know, I know. If we, ooh, I was about to say something that was going to get me in trouble. (laughs) If we just did these things, then these things would happen. But I'm going to tell you that those things cannot fix this elephant in the room. So I did my Ancestry.com because I was this little black girl in Jamaica, light-skinned enough that I, could, that I was not like dark-skinned blacks because that's the consequence of racism and colorism. But I was still black because my hair wasn't straight. And I couldn't understand, well, if my, gra- if my, gra- if my great-grandfather was a white, well, he wasn't white, was he? He was a blonde, blue-eyed black man. Then when I met Africans, continental Africans, and I met Nigerians, they started saying things like, you're an Igbo, I look at you, your face is round, your people are from the East. And I'm like, I'm a displaced person because I don't know what that means. But they welcomed me in, and it felt like home. So I did my Ancestry.com. So I'm black. Yeah. <laughs> Not like my husband, who's 99.9% black. So the majority of my ethnic, ethnic makeup is Nigerian. They were right. But I'm also Ivory Coast and Ghanaian, Benin and Togo, Cameroon, Congo, Western Bantu peoples. I'm going to let you sit with that for a second, because I don't think you understand what that means. Because when the colonizers went to the continent, they took people groups and mixed them up, changed the topography of the continent, mixed people who just, they just didn't, they just don't, they don't talk. They was like, you good, you over there, and I'm over here. But they threw them all together because of empire building. And then, thanks to the French and some Germans, we then created this whole idea of race and categorization, and then we decide whose race is better than whom. That's bad English. We'll work it out. So then the people who I'm descended from get shipped away to serve as commodity to grow cotton and sugarcane for years. Millions of us lie in the ocean on the way from Africa to the Caribbean. But we don't want to talk about it because it makes people uncomfortable. You know who it doesn't make uncomfortable? Me. Because that's part of my story. And if it wasn't for the Middle Eastern rabbi named Jesus, the way that I would respond to that stuff, hmm, things would burn. Oh, I promise you it would burn. But Jesus told me I can't burn none of y'all. And I've asked. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm 12% white. Want to know who is in my family tree? I got some Welsh up in here. I got a few Scottish folk. And of course, I have my 1% English in Northern, Northwestern Europe, and I'm 1% Irish. So I was like, well, look at that. My first name, Dillis, is Welsh. It means a good and true friend. My mom had an Oxford dictionary. 
colonizers. I mean, here we go. <laughs> but what does it look like to have an authentic Adventism that acknowledges the messiness of what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. You know what it looks like? It looks like we tell the truth. We tell all the truth. You know what it looks like? We just, we just, we just be uncomfortable for a little bit or a lot. Just, just sit in it. Chimamanda Ndichie Ngozi, my favorite African feminist currently, had a TED Talk she did circa 2009. And the title of the TED Talk is The Danger of a Single Story. And she says that a single story can have, um, she talks about the negative influences that single stories can have and how it, and, and identifies that the root causes of those stories um, shape misunderstandings of and continues to help us remain ignorant of other people. And she talks about how media, I remember living in Jamaica, reading literature about Brixton and snow. The island with the coconut trees and the mangoes and the Oti Iti apple. I'm learning about Brixton, the children in Brixton. The rain in Spain stays mainly on the plains. Like, it was good reading, but it wasn't germane to my experience as a descendant on my mother's family. I'm the fourth woman from enslavement on my mother's side. So this is recent history for me. So when I show up in spaces of worship or places of employment and I can't talk about my past and yet I continue to deal with the consequences of racism and sexism and classism and all the isms, I suffer alone in the family of God. And you don't even understand that when, when we sing these songs about how amazing Jesus is, that for me it's going to sound different. Because I want to know if Jesus is so amazing, at what point are you going to stop singing about it and be about it? At what point is it going to change the way you deal with those of us who are marginalized and are on the margins? And I'm talking about all of our intersecting identities. I'm talking about whether you identify as male, female, trans, it, 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 whether you are gay or straight, whether you are old or young, whether you are neurodiverse or normal. When are we going to start seeing that God is not confused about the diversity that is humanity? We are. And worse, in the name of God, we have murdered, lobotomized, put in prison, taken folk from their families of origin and put them someplace else. And I'm not talking about y'all. But if it's on your street, sorry. This just goes to show you this is something we do over and over and over again. And then we used God's name to justify it. And the danger of the story of believing that we can wait for heaven to deal with the sins of our fathers and our mothers and our grandfathers, that, that's a dangerous thing. Because all it does is perpetuate hate and justifies wickedness. I grew up in a country where if you, if we thought you were gay, we would beat you. And when the police came, they would let us continue to beat you. And then when you went to the police station, they would beat you again. Let me ask you a question. How did that affect me if this person was same gender loving? How did it personally affect me? Did it? Does it? No. So what gives me the right to put my hands on a human being and then tell myself the story that I'm doing it because God is against them? Shh. One of the things I keep processing, Lisa Clark Diller, is if I'm continuing to be complicit in my own abuse, because I keep showing up, I 
keep speaking. I keep saying, Jesus has turned the other cheek. Jesus has walked the extra mile. And I'm wondering, where are the people who are going to say, no more, enough. I'll take this lick for you today. Because you're bruised and you're broken and you're bleeding and it's not okay. Jesus didn't ask me to be a savior. He is the savior of the world, my time. So one of the things that I've learned when I think about an authentic Adventism is to apply this principle by Cockholm and Murray. Dr. Emmanuel Larte, who was a Ghanaian pastoral theologian, uses it when he talks about intercultural pastoral care. And I want to leave this with you all today because this is the invitation to understanding the diversity in the human family. And here's what it says. Every human person is in certain aspects. Read it with me. Like all others, like some others, and like no others. Which means it's going to take some work. We're going to have to talk to each other. We're going to have to learn from other people, and it's going to make us uncomfortable. My first white friend, I wasn't, I wasn't going to call her name. I'm not going to call her name because, yeah, anyway. She said to me when I met her for the first time, and we were having this, con- not the first time, but we were gotten this conversation about race. She said, Dillis, I didn't own any slaves. Nobody in my family owned slaves. She was Irish and Italian, and she was talking about her immediate family. And I remember, Nathan, when she said that to me, I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. I could, see, I could see why you don't understand why black folk, we got attitudes, right? Why we want a Black History Month. Thank you. I'm black 365 days of the year. On an leap year, that's 366. But thank you for the 28 days that you will acknowledge. You know, you know what I'm saying? And she was like, Dillis. And I heard her. And this Dillis today would say, yeah, but you know, the problem is, while you personally did not, and your family personally did not, you benefit from the empire that says you can walk around Lisa Clark dinner in a hotel for hours. That was what I saw our our story. Lisa said, girl, I'm in the hotel lobby, and I'm just there, and nobody asked me any questions. She said, "I, I realized that it was a privilege that I had, because if it was a black person in that hotel lobby, somebody would have asked her, how long are you going to be here? no matter how well-dressed she was, no matter how articulate she could be, because that's my lived reality. When I talked to my trans colleague the other day, and I explained that as a cis person, how I have some struggles, like there's some things that I'm still trying to work out. And I said, in our engagement, if I say something that's harmful, I'm asking you just to, just to hear me because I'm not trying to be harmful. I just, as a cis, I'm just trying to figure this out. And when she went on to explain to me about what it's like to live in a body that is so dissonant and then began to talk about her own concerns for her safety, it made me think of Brian Stevenson's quote that he says, proximity to suffering creates empathy. Hmm. If there is a story that we should be listening to, If there's a story we should be as apprentices working our hardest to do, it should be the story of a God who locates himself in time and place. He is a Middle Eastern human. He's not white. When I read the book Plantation Jesus, it talks about how American whites use the Bible to justify the enslavement of black bodies. Use the, use the Bible to justify apartheid, which we call Jim Crow. Yeah? Meanwhile, the Jesus of the scripture was, has particularities. He is born in a particular time, a particular place, a particular culture. And we take him out of it and erase it to justify because we've made him a God in our own image and likeness. I'm inviting Adventism to come back to the Bible. Because Jesus exemplifies what Brian Stevenson talks about. Jesus comes close. He does more than come close. He becomes one of us. He will bear the scars of Calvary for eternity. He's the beginning and the end. He speaks and things happen. Creatures are worshiping him. Day and night, 
What a flex. And what does he choose to do for eternity? Be human. Because he came close so that he could empathize, so that he could understand, so that he could say to Yahweh, listen, I know they're messy. <laughs> oh, they're messy. They always want to do it themselves. But like a good big brother, a good parent, I'll stay up all night. I'll clean their vomit. I'll change their diapers. And that's when they're babies. And when they get old, I'll change their diapers. I'll clean the vomit. When their memory fades, I will be with them. This is the God we serve. And if this is the God we serve, then the church ought to reflect this all the time. And let me tell you, it is hard. It is messy. It is messy. And I don't want to do it most days. If not for the Spirit or whatever we call the Holy Spirit. So what Jesus calls us to in diversity is to move from othering people and finding excuses to keep them away from the table and instead fight for ways to bring everybody to the table to make room. Because there's room. There's room. That's, I don't even understand the math. The math don't be mathing for me with Jesus. But Jesus is like, move over, we got room. But Jesus, they don't have the right clothes. Move over, they got room. But Lord, they sound right. They don't smell good. Lord, you know what they're doing in their bedroom. I, make room! So the kingdom of God can happen. Sarah, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, she's a mujerista theologian. Cubana, she took away kingdom, which is empire building that we've used. And she said, instead, let's call it the kingdom of God. And she learned that by watching the Franciscan friars working in Mexico and watched how the people worked the soil and the women learned how to have agency. And there was this sharing and this mutual giving. And that's what I would like to see authentic Adventism be about a kingdom of God. Leonardo da Vinci painted a, did a painting of the Last Supper. And in that painting, and I didn't realize that till today, that the painting is specifically depicting Jesus declaring that he was about to be betrayed. And so if you look at the painting, Sam, this is your stuff, you will notice Judas is reaching for the bread. Jesus is looking away this way. And Leonardo paints this picture to remind us of who Jesus really is. The single story of a God who loves sacrificially. And then the last painting I want to show you. You can skip to the very last one, um, Rod. It's, uh, it's uh, no, not that one. Sorry. Yeah, that one. This is by, I think his name is um, Moore is his last name. And this is a picture of the next supper. I'm sorry, not the next the 12 tribes at the Last Supper. Because this gentleman travels the world and everywhere he goes, he just sees God in people. And so my invitation, my challenge to us as a church is this. Start seeing people for who they are. Listen to their stories. If you're uncomfortable, it's okay. It's not gonna, you're not going to stay uncomfortable forever. But listen, see advocate, ally. Let's just be who Jesus has been for us. Let's not just sing about it, y'all. Let's be about it.